Hello lovely people. How much do you know about freak shows? Did you know that for a time, despite the frankly atrocious ways many performers were treated, being exhibited for the entertainment of non-disabled people in freak shows was one of the only reasons why disabled and visibly different people were allowed to be visible? Yeah. In my video about why you shouldn't use disability as a Halloween costume, I mentioned freak shows as an exception to the ugly laws that forbid disabled or visibly different people from existing in public spaces. But I wanted to dig deeper into the history of the freak show because I think there's something really interesting in the parallel and the attitudes for freak show performers and how disabled people are still treated and talked about today. Because it turns out when it comes to seeing disabled people as fully human, society is still a little stuck in the 19th and 20th centuries and I would really like us to catch up. If this sounds like your kind of thing, please subscribe to get more of my videos about queer history, disability justice and general vintage lesbian fabulousness. Before we dive in, I just want to give a heads up that I'm going to be sharing details about the exploitation and dehumanisation experienced by freak show performers, including the ableism and racism directed towards people of colour to uphold white supremacy, and using the word freak a lot. I think it's really important to discuss these topics, but they're also pretty heavy, so please take care of yourselves. So let's do one of my favourite things and get into the gritty realities of how horribly society treated marginalised people in the past. The Horrific History of the Freak Show The Oxford English Dictionary dates the term freak of nature, meaning an abnormally developed individual of the species, to the year 1847. This was the height of the freak show, though the idea of exhibiting people who look different is a lot older than that and, no surprises here, rooted in colonialism and white supremacy. Oh. A forerunner to the freak show is the exhibition and exploitation of Sarah Bartman. Sarah, or Sarah, sometimes referred to as Sache, was a Khoikhoi woman from the Eastern Cape of South Africa, born sometime in 1789, when the area was a Dutch Cape colony, although it became a British colony by the time she reached adulthood. You may have heard her referred to as the Hottentot Venus, but know that this is a Dutch term considered extremely offensive to her people, not an English portmanteau of someone being a hot totty, which yes is a thing we say. She was the first Khoi Khoi woman to be brought to England at around the age of 20 and exhibited as what marketers called the missing link between man and beast due to her supposedly exaggerated female form, the stereotypic body type uncommon in Western Europe at the time. Stereotypia is a genetic characteristic leading to increased accumulation of adipose tissue in the buttocks and thighs and whilst being actually not that uncommon, it unfortunately led to Sarah being marketed as a savage woman distinct from the civilised female of Europe. The European public developed an obsession with her reproductive organs. People in London were able to pay two shillings apiece to gaze upon her body, and for a little more could even poke her with a stick. Because George in London will always find a way to be that little bit worse than you expect, just gross all around. Sarah Bartman was not the only Khoi Khoi to be taken from her homeland. B.T. Barnum's show, Little People, advertised a 16-year-old Khoi Khoi girl named Flora as the missing link and later acquired six more Khoi Khoi children. But her exhibition in London just a few years after the 1807 abolishing of the slave trade created a scandal. A British abolitionist society, the African Association, conducted a newspaper campaign for her release, but her manager slash owner protested in response that Barnum's entitled to earn her living, stating, has she not as good a right to exhibit herself as an Irish giant or a dwarf? Referring to Charles Bryan, an Irish man who, standing at around 7 feet 7 inches tall, was, perform was performing and exhibiting himself as the Irish giant, but of course claiming in his posters that he was over 8 feet tall, and Patrick Cotter O'Brien, who genuinely was over 8 feet tall, and only the second person in medical history to verifiably be so. Yet, it won't shock you to learn that the lived experience of two very tall white men is slightly different to that of a black woman who was later put in a Parisian menagerie with actual animals and had her body studied by scientists to prove their racism. It's reported that she was treated as an anthropological freak and subjected to forced medical examinations and other cruelties. Wealthy customers could even pay for private demonstrations in their homes where guests were allowed to touch her. Not that they asked. 
her. Even after Bartman died in 1815, at just 25, her exhibition and exploitation continued. Her brain and genitals were pickled and placed on display in jars at Paris's Museum of Man. Her remains weren't repatriated and buried until 2002. Putting people who look different on display has happened for centuries, but the archetypal freak show, as the term is most often used today, refers to the phenomenon of American sideshows in the Victorian period. Promoted with sensationalist language and often flat-out lies, sideshows were additional exhibitions to circuses' mainstream performers and acts. Yeah, literally literally at their side, it's a, it's a sideshow. The main attractions in freak shows were human curiosities, the performers whose physical differences from the audiences made them worthy of exhibiting. The Lynchburg Museum says that these performers were literally placed on display and were often viewed as objects of entertainment and amusement rather than as human beings, and were fully exploited by their circus's employers. Perhaps the most well-known freak show was owned and run by P.T. Barnum. Yeah, I know him. He does not look like Hugh Jackman. His story was glamorised in the film The Greatest Showman. Oh, that was such a good film. It was so inspiring to see Hugh Jackman teaching the freaks that they should be proud of who they are. I'm not scared to be seen. I make no apologies. This is me. Okay. Well, Barnum's freak show also had its roots in colonialism. His first freak show act wasn't a paid performer he employed, but an enslaved person he bought. Yeah. The National Museum of African American History and Culture reports that Joyce Heath was in her late 70s or early 80s and was nearly blind and mostly paralysed when her enslaver sold her, or at least the right to exhibit her, to Barnum. He took her to museums and charged people money to look at her, claiming she was 161 years old, the former nursemaid to George Washington. Okay. When she died in 1836, Barnum sold tickets to her autopsy. When the coroner revealed that Heth was not 161, but about a half as old as Barnum had claimed, Barnum actually blamed Heth for lying to him. Yeah, it's all really, really bad, folks, but it's important that we acknowledge that this happened. Yeah, Barnum wasn't the only showman, though, exploiting his performers and lying to his audiences, but his success means that he's become synonymous with the freak show. So it's likely that the racism and harmful stereotypes he perpetuated in promoting his shows are typical of the attitudes held by other people running freak shows. According to Benjamin Rice, author of The Showman and the Slave, Barnum had these new ways of making racism seem fun and for people to engage in activities that degraded a racially subjected person in ways that were intimate and funny and surprising and novel, which is the weirdest sentence to to read in. This wasn't a great thing to. It's not a great thing to research. Like, P.T. Barnum is not. He's not an A plus plus research topic. If you're having a bad day, wouldn't advise. Presenting performers through this lens taught audiences how they should be interacting with performers and other people who looked like the performers. Now, Nadia Derbeck, Associate Professor of History at the University of Utah and author of Spectacle of Deformity, Freak Shows and Modern British Culture, says that to dismiss freak shows as either merely purient or entirely exploitative thus oversimplifies what were in fact complex performances that addressed critical questions about different. Freak shows were selling much more than merely a cheap peek at a monstrous body. In fact, they helped to educate the audience about their place in the hierarchy of classes, races, civilizations, and nations that was so crucial to the 19th century worldview. I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that freak shows also served as a reminder of how people could themselves be seen as monstrous and other if they deviated from the accepted path. Prior to the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, being passed in the 1980s, there was actually little legislation to protect the rights and working conditions of disabled people. Now, some states passed legislation banning the exhibition of extraordinary bodies. These weren't necessarily about protecting the performers, but about whether the sight of disability in visibly different people would be distressing to audiences. Seeing them makes me so sad of how awful their lives must be. They're so brave. Okay. In an article in UCLA Entertainment Law Review entitled Dangerous Bodies, 
freak shows, expression and exploitation. Brother May Ford argues such laws assumed the harm that comes from freak shows has nothing to do with the exploitive attitudes the freak shows encourage, rather the potential harm is the inevitable disgust of the audience at seeing deviant bodies. Just like with the ugly laws, it's the rights and comfort of able people that were prioritised. And that same attitude applies to the narratives that have dominated when we talk about freak show, where the voices of freak show owners and audiences are centred over the voices of the actual performers. Not being listened to? I'm sure that's not an experience that any disabled person watching can relate to. No voice to tell our own stories. Although we're talking about freak shows, that's a term that only became more commonly associated with such shows after Barnum's death. However, freaks was definitely used to describe the performers themselves, generally as a pejorative. Surprise. While researching this video, I found a fascinating story about when Barnum and Bailey's freak show was performing in London in January 1899. So apparently a number of the freak show performers rebelled and called a meeting to protest being marketed as freaks and demanded a new name. So Historic UK says that the news of the revolt and suggestions that the freaks might even go on strike provoked a media frenzy across Britain. Articles were written on the final awakening of personal pride and abnormal species of the human race. Despite all their hardships, they're standing up for themselves and not accepting the status quo. So inspiring. Um. That's one takeaway. After news of this freak's revolt was reported, a number of alternative names were suggested and the performers met again. After a vote, they settled on prodigies as the term they wanted to be referred to by and sent representatives to see James Bailey, who was in sole charge after Barnum's death nine years earlier. Bailey apparently agreed and ordered that all the signs and publicity materials should use prodigies rather than freaks. If you're thinking that all of this sounds too good to be true, I mean, since when do non-disabled folk ever listen to disabled people about the language that we ask people used to talk about us with without making a massive fuss, especially in these times? Well, you'd be right, yeah. Yeah, because just a few years later, a very similar story hit the headlines. Barnum and Bailey's Freak Show was performing in New York and the word freaks had appeared again in all the posters and flyers for the show. Hmm. When news of another protest meeting held by the performers broke, some journalists apparently noted that the arguments put forward by the performers were oddly similar to those that had been used in London a few years earlier. However, the story was too good not to report on, so reports of this second freak's revolt were published. It's just such an empowering story. Ah. Mm. Yeah. The truth was later revealed by the Washington Herald, who revealed that both Freak's Revolts had been a publicity stunt, an incredibly successful one, orchestrated by Richard F. Toddy Hamilton, Barnum and Bailey's press agent. So what initially sounded like an empowering story about disabled people and exploited workers banding together to make their voices heard is actually a PR stunt. It's not clear that the performers' meetings that the newspapers reported on ever even happened. What's more, it's likely that it was thought up and executed without any input from the performers themselves. Did anyone actually ask the performers if they minded being called freaks? Now, to be fair, not all performers in freak shows were disabled or had visible differences or minded being called freaks. Some of the performers enhanced or even created their otherness with costumes and makeup. However, the performers' managers and the people who ran the freak shows, and it's probably safe to say made a lot more money than the performers, were largely white, straight, cis, non-disabled men. <laughs> Hamilton, who wasn't disabled himself, put together this feel-good story about the performers in order to get people talking about the freak show. Get people sitting in seats. The performers didn't probably say any of the things they reported saying. They had words put in their mouths by Hamilton and were given agency in a story that probably didn't have any reality. But isn't it so good that people had heard the freaks, sorry, the prodigies, story? I mean, it really made me feel like I can do more than I think I can. Yeah, okay. And the story might well have reassured the audiences that the performers weren't being exploited and made them feel more comfortable with paying to go and see them on display. After all, they were able to make demands of the man who ran the circus and had collective power to decide what language they wanted people to use to talk about them. Again, according to Historic UK, Hamilton even said that he felt a little ashamed of how successful this particular publicity stunt was. 
I wonder if the performers were paid more when the show's profits increased due to the lucrative PR story about them. Does any of this sound familiar to anyone else? Not disabled people telling disabled people stories for us without actually giving us a voice or using our stories for their benefit is something that we still see today. I'm going to talk about this more later in the video. Yet, despite all of this, the exploitation, the lack of agency, and the horrific conditions experienced by many performers, there were still many reasons why disabled people wanted to join and perform in freak shows, which really speaks to how appalling the existence of disabled people has been throughout history. The benefits of freak shows before the existence of welfare. Freak shows might be exploitative and dehumanising for performers, but they also offered disabled and visibly different people a rare opportunity to actually earn money. Freak shows were a big business. At their peak in the mid-19th century, there were reportedly over 100 independent freak shows touring the US. An article published as part of the Borough of Manhattan Community College 22nd Modern Languages Department Colloquium, which is a thing I've been struggling to say, oh, which was all about human monstrosity in fiction and film, said that in an area before there was welfare or workers' compensation, severely disabled people often found that placing themselves on exhibition was their only choice and opportunity for making a living. The performers should be grateful that people wanted to employ them, rather than complaining about their working conditions. A gratitude practice is just so important. No. And performing in an organised freak show was a relatively stable way to earn a living. In an article before the ADA there was the freak show, American writer and journalist Kim Kelly wrote, Legendary showman Ward Hall, long known as the king of the sideshow, remembered in his biography that the Billboard magazine used to run advertisements for disabled performers and that when travelling freak shows came through towns, the locals had the opportunity at least once a year to come out and see the show and ask for a job. With limited other opportunities to make money, performing in a freak show might allow disabled people to lift their families out of poverty and even have some level of agency over their own life. While it doesn't cancel out the abuse and discrimination performers experienced, performers had an opportunity to be seen as fully human and treated with respect. Instead of being ignored, they were acknowledged. Rather than being shunned, they were celebrated. They might not have been accepted, but they were admired. They might find fame. And not only fame, despite their disabilities and differences, but because of their disabilities and differences. Charles Stratton, who performed as General Tom Thumb in Barnum's Freak Show, became a global celebrity, along with Barnum Stratton, who was six years old and 25 inches tall, which I think is shorter than... We had rulers in primary school that were 30 centimetres. Yeah, I know. British education system. Painful. <clears throat> they met Queen Victoria at Buckingham Palace in March 1844. I can tell you all of the kings and queens of England, okay? I just can't do inches. He sang! He danced! He amused everyone with his impression of Napoleon. He's just so adorable. Yeah, it's the Victorian era equivalent of winning Big Brother and being on the front cover of Hello or People or OK Magazine. If, you know, it was the 2000s. Anyway, if it was happening today, I'm sure all the Queen's ladies in waiting would have got their phones out to start filming when the Queen's dog started chasing Stratton and barking at him and he had to brandish his tiny cane like a sword and pretend to spar with the poodle. That is absolutely a viral 19th century TikTok right there. After she met Stratton, Queen Victoria wrote in her diary that after dinner, we saw the greatest curiosity I, or indeed anybody, ever saw. Stratton might have met the British Queen, but the language she uses to describe him is more like how we talk about items in a museum than a living person. Can we also just point out, though, that he was six? That is a six-year-old being chased by a dog. After getting married in 1863, Stratton and his wife were received by President Abraham Lincoln. Stratton's fame was unusual, but many freak show performers were well known as actors or more mainstream entertainers as well as freak show performers. Unfortunately, in order to hold on to the small portion of power that disabled and visibly different people might gain as freak show performers, they had to participate in white supremacist capitalist structures of society. An example of this is Chan and Eng Bunker, who are the reason Siamese twins became a synonym for conjoined twins. 
Born in what is now Thailand in 1811, Chang and Eng were conjoined at the sternum. When they were 18, a Scottish merchant named Robert Hunter came across them and reportedly paid their mother $500 to exhibit her children as a curiosity on a tour of the world. They saw barely any money from their performances and were treated incredibly poorly, including being subject to experiments by members of the Royal College of Surgeons. So they ended their contract with Hunter when they turned 21 and became self-employed performers who could perform on their own terms. Go then. After they stopped performing, they bought a plantation in North Carolina. Wait, where's this going? Hmm. Despite the exploitation they experienced, their plantation was run on the labour of enslaved people, many of whom they had bought as children. It really shows how marginalised people are taught to align themselves with societal power structures in order to differentiate themselves from other marginalised groups, which is why intersectional approaches to feminism and disability activism are so important. In addition to all of this, some activists believe the freak shows were incredibly important to the early development of disability culture. According to Maria Town, the president of the American Association of People with Disabilities, sideshows set the stage for modern conceptions of disability, identifying people with disabilities as objects of scorn and pity, as inherently other from mainstream society. The disability stereotypes that sideshows perpetuated were what the disability rights movement sought to resist. However, even though sideshows were exploitative, they were spaces where people with disabilities, like famed performers Chang and Eng, began to assert their worth and curate how individuals looked at them. Even in the 21st century, we're still fighting for representation for disabled people in the media. While we might not see the exploitation of freak shows, performers as good representation today, Freak show performers showed other disabled people that an existence where they were treated with respect was possible. Though it's important to note that this respect probably didn't extend to disabled and visibly different people who weren't freak show performers. It's like today when a celebrity tweeting about a brand might get the company to pay attention and try to fix the problem, but probably wouldn't do anything if someone without millions of followers had said anything. That but with being treated like an actual human being. But that's not how society treats disabled people today. We've left all of that behind in the 19th and 20th centuries, right? Right? Oh, of course. Well... Modern freak show, being exceptional justifies existence. Our voyeuristic fascination, there we go, with otherness, exists to this day, and there is just many ways that the media has continued to use harmful tropes that alienate and vilify disabled people. And one especially harmful legacy that the freak show has left off with is the idea that disabled people need to be exceptional to be seen as worthy of rights and respect. We're often shown stories of disabled people who succeed despite their disability, who are praised because they're able to overcome their disability in some way, and the success of one disabled people is used as a cudgel to beat down other disabled people and ask them why they aren't able to do the same things. And what happens to the disabled people who aren't able to push through and meet ableist standards in the same way? Now, to be clear, I think it's amazing that people are able to be more open about their disabilities and chronic illnesses. I also think it's amazing that people are able to do really cool things. It's important to normalise the fact that all of our bodies are different and work in different ways. Some of us are Paralympians. Some of us are Olympians. Some of us can do sports. I don't think I could do sports. My body was not disabled. To be fair, I don't think I'd want to do sports. I think we've begun to slowly change the public perception of disabled people now. Right, right, I mean, you're here. I personally love that I can go on Instagram and find examples of disabled people just living their lives, particularly disabled mums, because that's something I struggle with being. <laughs> I mean, struggle with finding represented in places, there are some really unique struggles to being a disabled parent, kind of specifically the, the guilt. So back on track, the internet, great thing, but I also think there are people who can unintentionally perpetuate the idea that disabled people have to be exceptional, and by that, I mean disabled people ourselves. I'm not going to name specific people or creators, blah blah blah, but I sometimes wonder how other disabled people feel too, watching, say, a disabled content creator who works out in the gym every single day lifting weights and talking about how, well, if they can do it, anyone can. 
I personally don't love it. Feel like you're kind of beating yourself up because you can't do the same thing? Anyone else feel like we should all be trying harder? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I do. I don't feel brilliant today, okay? Because I hung out with some non-disabled mums yesterday and I... I felt a difference. Because my kid couldn't stay and play as long as the other kids. Because I can't get cold. <laughs> or else I get... I'm in incredible pain. And then I couldn't play with him this morning. How does anyone else feel <laughs> really awkward <laughs> when you tell someone what it is you have, what's up with you, and they go, oh, I know someone who has that. Do you ever feel that moment of, oh, mm, like the, anticipatory horror? Fear of what exactly does, <laughs> what does the person you know do? Because is it going to be something amazing? Quite often it, it does turn out to be for me. Um, I, have an, I have a range of conditions and combined they make a not very great functioning body. I mean it looks good. We've got that working for me. I can't help but have this thing where I bump into people who ha know someone who happens to be deaf or happens to have EDS or happens to have, well no, I don't ever actually meet anyone who has, <laughs> who has my, uh, my nerve disability because it's pretty rare. The other two, I meet people and they go, oh, I know someone who has that. She's a champion rower. <laughs> like, cool. Excellent. I think this has become a video on a disability inferiority complex, which is fascinating. Not where I thought this was going today. So how are able-bodied people who watch those reels going to react the next time they come across someone with that disability? We all know that non-disabled people are really understanding that Disabled people might have different energy levels from day to day, let alone that two people with the same disability might have completely different limits and capabilities. And then, of course, most of my feelings get even messier when it comes to celebrities talking about the disability and chronic illness because, I mean, I really hope that people like Selena Gomez speaking out about having lupus and Daisy Ridley talking about her endometriosis helps those conditions to be taken more seriously. Unfortunately, lots of media coverage still trivialises both the conditions and the celebrities, refusing to acknowledge the very real impact disability and chronic illness can have and probably does actually have on their lives. But there's also part of me that knows that this kind of representation isn't reflective of what most people with the same health conditions experience, but a lack of other visibility will mean they'll still be compared to them and kind of sometimes find wanting because most people don't have the same resources as famous actresses or musicians. And it doesn't help that when it comes to mainstream media coverage of disabled people, the visibility that we get is still frequently inspiration. Inspiration. <laughs> hmm. The term inspiration was coined by Stella Young, an Australian comedian, journalist and disability rights activist, when she was editor at Ramp Up, which is the Australian Broadcasting Corporation's site featuring news and discussions about disability in 2012. Young wrote a piece calling out society's tendency to turn disabled people into inspirational memes. Well, I think the only disability is a bad attitude. You can do anything. In her brilliant 2014 TEDx talk entitled I'm Not Your Inspiration, Thank You Very Much, Young described images online of amputees running on prosthetic legs along with the words, the only disability is a bad attitude. She points out how uh, incorrect this is and how no amount of having a positive attitude and smiling at a flight of stairs has ever turned them into a ramp for her. Young chose the term deliberately, she said, even though it's going to get me demonetized, because such images objectify one group of people for the benefit of another. You can all totally debate about in the comments, if you like, and whether it is always for the objectification of one person for the benefit of another, or whether you can have truly 
equalized. Am I just saying so that Clara has to continuously uh, make it censor safe? Yes, yes I am. If you continue to talk about in the comments, please do uh, somehow censor the word Thank you. Young said, we're objectifying disabled people for the benefit of non-disabled people. The purpose of these images is to inspire you, to motivate you, so that we can look at them and think, well, however bad my life is, it could be worse. I could be that person. And inspiration, like the freak show, serves as a reminder to able people of their place in the wider society. And that place is at the top. Writer Andrew Polarang mentions that disabled people are used as stock figures in larger cultural narratives about hard work, gratitude and other traditional value. A disabled person lifting weights or working every day for less than minimum wage is a convenient and seemingly apolitical object lesson for the rest of us to work harder, complain less and be thankful for what we have. Also yes, you can pay disabled people less than the minimum wage. Human beings don't need money if uh, they have something that means they need more money. It's a really weird loophole. Don't believe in the welfare state anymore, kids. I'm afraid the Tories have taken it. But disabled people don't exist to make non-disabled people feel better about themselves. We shouldn't have to live lives that are worthy in some way to be deserving of dignity and basic human rights. We certainly don't owe it to anyone to perform how exceptional we are to be treated with respect. In fact, we're allowed to be lazy. The Paralympics, granted, really changed the mainstream understanding of disability in the UK, but just not necessarily in the most positive way. It popularised the narrative that disabilities are superpowers, so rather than pushing for disabled people to be accepted, as we are, the message was now that disabled people should feel empowered by their disability. We all have varying relationships with our disability and have very different feelings about it, and that's totally fine. Whilst it is important to move away from the idea that disability is shameful, the idea that disabled people are superheroes can end up singling us out and putting us under more scrutiny. But the Paralympics really showed that anyone can do anything and you shouldn't let your disability hold you back. There's really no excuse for laziness, you know. Disabled people are allowed to be lazy. The narrative of disabled people as lazy can be a really harmful one. Disabled people are often accused of faking our disabilities, especially in order to claim benefit, and our government seems to be invested in promoting this narrative. In May 2023, The Big Issue reported that from the people who had been denied PIP, which stands for Personal Independence Payment, Disability Benefits, by the Department of Work and Pensions, the DWP, and have been told no again when they asked for a mandatory reconsideration of that decision, 80% of people who appealed the decision further were awarded benefits. Which means at least 80% of the people who were denied PIP in the first place shouldn't have been. Because unlike the people promoting freak show performers, disabled people aren't lying about our disabilities or exaggerating the impact they can have on our lives. While disabled people aren't faking our disabilities, I think it's also important to unpack the idea that being lazy is a bad thing. Our ableist capitalist society praises productivity and tells us that hard work is good and worthy to keep us exhausted so we can't demand a more equal society for everyone. There is nothing inherently good or virtuous about working long days or getting up at 6am to go for a run. Some people want to get up early and run 5k before breakfast. Some people don't. I am not an early morning running person. I am a snuggling up in bed with my toddler reading books morning person. Now, I don't necessarily think that's because I'm disabled. I think that's just who I am as a human being. And I don't have to go out and try running just because I'm disabled. Oh, but have you tried the Couch to 5K app? It really worked for me. Like performers in a freak show, disabled people today are expected to perform our disability and explain why we're disabled. Whether it's the GWP or random people in the street, people act as though they're entitled to information about us and our bodies. But why can't you just tell us what is your disability? I, I really don't have time for this. Even if I wanted to explain it to you, which I don't, do you have any idea how long it would take me to talk through all of my diagnoses? I, I, I can't be bothered. I mean, you can very much watch this video up here and then at least I get some AdSense money for it. Did you notice how, after the Doctor Who's 60th anniversary special, The Star Beast, people were sharing photos of actress Ruth Madley, who played unit scientific advisor Shirley Ann Bingham, sitting with her legs crossed, 
Now, Madley is an ambulatory wheelchair user and a number of people sharing the photo of Madley with one of her legs crossed over the other were implying, or outright stating, that she couldn't possibly be disabled. In an Instagram post about how being able to stand doesn't make her disability less valid, Madley says that she's frequently experienced comments like, there are just a few steps into the building, but you can walk so that won't be a problem, right? People assume they know about our bodies and disabilities better than we do. There are days when I'm able to walk and play on the floor with Rue and, and I, those days don't invalidate my disability or the days when I can't get out of bed. I wonder about the impact of people like Gigi Hadid being who folks think of when they think about chronic illness like Hashimoto disease, which is an autoimmune thyroid disease. So celebrities being open about their health conditions may have raised awareness, but it also leaves the impression that everyone with a chronic illness can be a beautiful model flying between New York, London, Milan, Paris to walk in 16 shows in the autumn winter 2020 season. <laughs> Vogue says that's an impressive number of shows, and that's really great for her, but that kind of schedule wouldn't even be conceivable for many disabled people. Or Kendall Jenner. Niche joke. I've done photo shoots and catwalks in the past, both when I was just like, girl X, and no one cared that I was shaking from exhaustion and about to vomit. To which you might say, fair, because I put myself in that position. But um, human beings are not chattel, so. <laughs> No. And also I've done photo shoots or fashion shows where I am there because I am who I am, that deaf and disabled vintage YouTuber who also happens to be gay, and thus my needs are taken care of. But even when people are making huge strides towards accommodating me, it's still utterly exhausting and the only thing I do that week. You don't really see the behind the scenes dead eyed slumped in a chair look just the glamorous catwalk one. And it sets up the expectation that disabled people should want to have a life that looks like that, the highs and, and then the lows. Often articles about people with disabilities and chronic illnesses focus on how people are keeping positive and learning to thrive with their diagnosis. This is a, these are direct quotes from an article by Gigi Hadid, which is a textbook example of inspiration, by the way. Um, Honestly, I'm not interested in doing those things. I do not have to be positive when I'm in pain. I literally cannot thrive when I am experiencing a week-long migraine. I do not have to use the last of my energy to smile for your comfort. I would never tell someone to stop talking openly about their disability or chronic illness, but I think it's important to examine who that content is for and its impact. Are these depictions of disability that help normalize it, or do they create unrealistic expectations that able-bodied people use to judge whether or not people are really disabled? Are they motivating and empowering disabled people, showing them what is possible to achieve, or do they make us all feel worse about our limitations and like we're not trying hard enough? I just feel so motivated when I see disabled people succeeding. Yeah, it really makes me realise how much more I could be doing. Yeah. Even today, society still struggles with the idea that disabled people can have agency and know ourselves well enough. It's exhausting to constantly be fighting to be seen as human. So please, remember that you are not a bad person or undeserving of human rights just because you're lazy. In fact, we should embrace and celebrate people being lazy as a way to push back against the idea that people's worth should be determined by their productivity. It feels like we're being told that we're allowed to exist and take up space as long as we're excelling, as long as we're exceptional by the standards set by an ableist society. Huh. That was a long, big and heavy topic. So how are we all feeling? I'm very drained. It's just so upsetting to hear about how hard disabled people's lives are. Anyone else feeling just mildly frustrated with the expectations put on disabled people? in part because of how other people are allowed to talk over us to tell our stories. Putting together this video has honestly made me want to be more lazy. Deliberately so. <sighs> you know how sit-ins are a form of direct action? I think protests for disability rights should be lions, complete with pillows. Who are your favourite folks to follow on social media who celebrate just existing as a disabled person without having to be exceptional to prove that we're deserving of basic human rights? What are your favourite depictions of disabled people who don't feel like they exist for the gaze of an abled audience? One of my favourites is Nina Tame. I don't 
actually know if that's the correct pronunciation of her surname, but Nina Tame. <laughs> and have you joined the Calgon Fosa Club yet? It's an exclusive club for my channel members, and if you become a clubby, clubbies get access to a monthly behind the scenes video, a shout out in your birthday month, and my little face after your name down in the comments, and comments rise to the top on all videos. What's that phrase? You don't have to be gay to join us, but it helps. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.